For many, the ultimate 60s GT Ferrari is the 250 GT short wheelbase. And certainly, it's one of mine and DK's favourites. And we've been lucky enough to handle a great number of these over the years. And this example is just such one of those cars that we've sold not once, but twice in the last 15 years. This is chassis 2221 GT. It was the third car supplied new to the UK, and it was actually the car that was personal to Ronnie Hoare, the founder of Marinello Concessionaires. He took delivery of it in late 1960, and it was the Earl's Court Motor Show car where it took centre stage. After that, he covered 10,000 miles in the car until late 1961, when he advertised the car for sale and subsequently sold it to Ron Fry. Now, Ron Fry was from the Bristol area and was famously confused with the Fry chocolate family, but he actually was just a normal guy with a normal job who later on went into the actual motor trade, but had a string of fabulous cars during the 1960s. And the short wheelbase is where his relationship with really, truly special cars started. When he bought the car, as I mentioned, it was 10,000 miles from new. It had been repainted red and black very early on in its life, presumably in advance of its showing at the motor show, because recently discovered factory records indicate that this car was actually Blue Sarah new. However, all of the photographs that exist of it whilst it was competing in the UK were of it in Rosso Corsa, as we see it today. Now, I mentioned competing in the UK. During 1962 and 63, Ron campaigned this car tirelessly, taking an amazing 33 trophies home from a variety of hill climbs, sprints and race meetings, including breaking the lap record at Castle Coombe. So this car was a true race car. But it was delivered new with a steel body. That said, it had a multitude of competition features, very much like the ex-Richard Colton RNLI car that we've discussed in our other videos that we've recently restored. So what did that include? Well, open air tray, uprated cams, competition spec wheels, a long range fuel tank with outside fuel filler, ribbed case, aluminium case gearbox, and bucket seats. So essentially, and again the documentation that's on file between the Colonel and the factory, indicates that he wanted a car that was racing spec, competition spec from you, but with a steel body, presumably so that when it was on the stand at the motor show, it didn't have any dents or cracks or splits. And perhaps this was his car that was supposed to be the true demonstrator. It comes just after 1993 and 1995, which are traditionally known as the first two cars imported to the UK by the Colonel. And I think it's fair to say that perhaps he sold those cars very quickly. And this car, was to replace those and to be his personal demonstrator. And having covered 10,000 miles during that first year, I don't think it's unfair to assume that lots of people had a go in the car at that time before it ended up with Ron. Now, Ron Fry, as I said, went on to own a number of important cars. So after this, he had a 250 GTO, and then following that, this very 250 LM, known as Ron 54, because it still wears the number plate today, that's chassis 6105. And with those three cars, he won lots and lots and lots of events. This guy was out every weekend. It's amazing to think that he remained married, in fact. And actually, on that note, we were lucky enough to invite his grandsons over to see both of these cars recently, and they showed us reams and reams of period paperwork, photographs, footage, and, of course, trophies that he won at that time. And apparently, it was, in the end, his wife that put her foot down after an accident in his GT40 that he bought subsequently to racing the 250LM, who said, enough's enough, it's time for us to have our family time, time for us to enjoy life together. And he went on to have a very healthy and long life, having had this fabulous early 60s motor racing career. But back to the 250 short wheelbase. So the 250 short wheelbase is, I think, the last of the true gentleman racers road car that could be driven to the track, competed with, and driven home, as this very car did. But you might argue the GTO is, is also that car, but when you've been in a 250 GTO, it's hot, it's noisy, it's very raw, there's no carpet, there's no leather whatsoever. It's, it really is a racing GT car for the road. The short wheelbase still maintains some of that finesse and the comfort of the GT Ferraris of the 50s and 60s. Full leather throughout, carpets, a trimmed dash, etc., etc. Now, 
Today we find ourselves in the fortunate position of having three different short wheelbases in our midst, and I thought this would be a great opportunity to explain the evolution of the short wheelbase. It's fair to say and easy to assume that all short wheelbases are the same, but they're not. There are what we would refer to as two different specifications, or a Series 1 and a Series 2. The 1960 cars and the 1961 spec cars. In fact, the second series of cars, the 61 spec cars, were built in 1961 and through to 1962. There were 103 of those versus the 64 built in 1960. And for the UK, the first five cars were built in 1960, one of those being the all-aluminium Rob Walker full competition spec car that went on to win the Goodwood TT that year. So that left four cars, and interestingly, all four of those tended to have these competition specification features from the factory. So before we take this short wheelbase out to stretch its legs, let's just focus on those different details between the 60 and 61 spec cars that we discussed. So first of all, when we look at the two cars alongside each other, you can see that the earlier car has a narrower, simpler, prettier stance almost in terms of it's not as butch and as wide as the later cars. The later cars have bigger wheels, but the nose was slightly higher. The windscreen on the later cars was in fact bigger and the roof sat higher. And the shape of the tops of the doors curves down at the rear of this earlier car, whereas on a later car, they were kept more of a, a, a straighter profile so that it was actually easier for people to get into the car so they didn't hit their head as they got in. Equally, the fuel filler moved from in the boot lid here onto the rear wing. And that's why on these later cars, you see so few of them have an outside fuel filler because it was under a lockable cap. Underneath, the car was virtually the same, although the chassis frame was actually dimensionally beefier on the later cars, perhaps because of a rigidity problem, who knows, but that's what they did for the later cars. The chassis frame was, as I said, actually a beefier, bigger dimension chassis frame. Now, interestingly, on the competition cars from 1961, like this one over here, that we refer to as a CFAC hot rod, which is the ultimate competition short wheelbase, instead of opting for the later, beefier style chassis frame, they maintained and opted for the 1960 specification chassis frame. So this chassis frame, although this being a later built car and not built in 1960, is the same as the 1960 car. Now other subtle differences are the very earliest 1960 cars did not feature quarter lights. In fact, this car is one of the earliest cars to actually cross over to that. On the early cars, again, the roof vent was not in the roof, but in the rear window to allow for air to come out of the cockpit. And as we already touched on, the windscreen's higher, the nose is higher, and the car has a slightly more aggressive stance to it. Another small feature of the later cars that don't feature on the earlier cars is that the earlier cars would have had a quick lift jack. So on the side of the cars, they had jacking points on the chassis and you could put a jack in to lift the car up. Whereas this was much more of a traditional jack-in-a-bag setup. And that's what these plugs are on the sills that you see on the later cars. You also lose the seam at the front of the door edge here on the sills that the earlier cars feature. But these, these are, as I said, jacking plugs. You remove these, the jack slips in there, and then you wind it up to lift the car up, as opposed to having a full-on heavy-duty quick-lift jack that lifts the chassis up. So that's the outside. In terms of the inside, you also had some subtle differences to the interior. On these later 1961 spec cars, we have a full body colour painted dashboard below the leather top, whereas it's fully trimmed on the earlier cars. The centre console, or the transmission tunnel, is square in shape as opposed to being round, and the boot is a different design, so that you had an actual parcel shelf behind the seats that you could put bags on or whatever. Whereas in the earlier cars, it's got a full height parcel shelf with an access panel to get to the spare wheel because the spare wheel is actually located in a different place on the later cars. But other than that, as I said before, the actual mechanical specification is very similar aside from the chassis upgrades for the later cars. Uh, and that's that. You know, in terms of the differences between other cars, they're all slightly different, but you will find that more of the earlier steel 1960 built cars had lots of competition features and lots of nice upgrades, such as bucket seats and open air trays and sports exhausts, long range fuel tanks. And that's what makes these so special. But what I love about this car is it was bought by a gentleman racer who did absolutely use it as intended, drove it to the track, raced it throughout his ownership, and then went on to upgrade to a 250 GTO and later a 250 LM and then onto a GT40.
So this really is a reflection of why we love short wheelbases. The true multi-purpose tool, highly versatile, ever so beautiful, and of course, great to drive.